Ever have one of those games you knew existed for the longest time but never felt like playing it or checking it out? For me, that was Pikmin. Well, with the impending release of the fourth game, which as someone who knew nothing about the series, even I knew this was a big deal. Delayed one last time. They announced Pikmin 4, which to be honest was one of the last things I was expecting considering Pikmin is probably one of Nintendo's least popular franchises. I was almost certain if Pikmin ever came back, it would be a remaster of the first two games. I finally decided to check these games out. It was kind of a shock to my senses when I played through it and slowly realized that this is, in fact, a masterpiece, and possibly one of the best GameCube titles ever released. Honestly, I didn't know what to expect. I thought that maybe it would be a fun distraction from the types of games I usually like playing, but as if by the greatest stroke of irony, this game turned out to be exactly my type of game in every way, shape, and form. More than any other on the system. What I got from this game was something so meticulously put together, so focused, so razor sharp with its level design, mechanics, and presentation, that I was in a state of shock by the time I first finished it. I think the best way to explain all this high praise is my experience with the game and me interpreting it as what the typical first experience of the game will be as you strive to reach the game's true ending. But I'll condense it down to one linear little anecdote so it's not all over the place. So, here we go. This is Captain Olimar. He's an explorer who you play as, and despite what I said earlier about this game being so focused and sharp, it actually has a lot of text in it. But here's the catch. Everything you see in-game is delivered from the perspective of the observations and journaling of this one character. From here on out, every time something new or important in the game happens, Olimar will comment on it. Sometimes he'll drop hints on how the game works in the guise of observations, but other times he'll just muse about stuff. It makes any tutorializing, especially the early stuff like the control explanations, feel unusually organic and less immersion-breaking than in a lot of other games. As fate would have it, his ship is struck by a stray meteorite, which sends him plummeting down to crash land on the surface of an unknown planet. Olimar wakes up, and you gain control of him. You gain control of him and the game doesn't give any prompt or directions. You wander the small area aimlessly until you inevitably bump into this red thing that he calls an onion. Just go with it. This thing spits out a red seed. You press A next to it and pull out a small plant-like creature which Olimar calls a Pikmin based on a certain brand of carrots from his home planet. You throw it at one of these brightly colored flowers, which are the most attention-grabbing thing in the area, and this little guy will knock the middle part off and bring it back to the onion, which will spit out more seeds. From there, you have more Pikmin, which you can throw at more of these pellets, and soon you can haul back bigger ones to get even more Pikmin at once. Congratulations, you've now learned the first step in playing the game. Now when you've got at least 10, you can have them move this box that's in the way. This opens up more area where you'll find a piece of Olimar's ship. You throw your Pikmin at it, find out you don't have enough, farm more from the space you opened up, and then you can have them carry it back to the ship. Once attached, the ship now barely has enough functionality to fly Olimar to a nearby area. Things are looking good now, right? Well, here's the thing. Olimar can't breathe on this planet, or in space for that matter. His suit's life support functions only last for a maximum of 30 days, and after that, he's dead. But this isn't just the game's story. This is the game's actual gameplay premise. These are in-game days that play out in real time, and with each one that passes, you're closer to your demise. Each day lasts on a timer, and by extension, the whole game does. But with what just happened with the Pikmin helping out, there's still a sense of hope. So, what better of a name to give to the first major area of the game than Forest of Hope? The music here is so serene and beautiful and, well, hopeful. The main melody is delivered by a keyboard, and then strings in a theme that lazily blows through the area. But underneath that peaceful exterior, there is stuff to worry about. There is wild creatures that prey on Pikmin. And wouldn't you know it, Pikmin are super weak by themselves. Their true strength comes from attacking in groups. You need to learn the pace of combat, when to throw groups at enemies, when to call them back. They are so vulnerable that a lot of times one hit instantly kills them. You have them harvest the enemies for more seeds, carry back a ship part, and then you discover another onion 
that sprouts a yellow Pikmin. Build up enough of them and you'll find out you can have them carry these explosive rocks and use them to blow up walls. They can also be thrown higher. The game makes sure you know which walls need to be blown up and which ones need to be broken by Pikmin attacks right away. It places the latter one I mentioned right here at the start that you're forced to deal with first, so you're guaranteed to recognize the difference between the two. Even your first time through, making steady progress here isn't hard, and the map is very straightforward and linear, even allowing you to open a shortcut back to your ship at the end. You'll spend a few days here if this is your first time, but soon you'll have collected enough parts to open up a new area for exploration. This second area is called the Forest Naval. And remember how nice and brightly lit the previous area was? Well, now it's dark. You've got limited visibility. The design of the area is way more vertical, with many heights and layers. It's no longer a straightforward path, but now it's almost maze-like. And now you're expected to come across this third blue onion as soon as you can. This grants you access to blue Pikmin, who, unlike the other two types, don't drown in water. You've now got all the tools to find your ship parts here. The challenge is actually finding them. And it's here where the game truly takes off. Each ship part is like a mini challenge. For one, you have to make sure you can get it back safely without enemies interfering, meaning you do have to spend some time on combat. But the real challenge is reaching the ship part and getting it. This can range from as simple as building a little walkway to it, fishing it out of the water, killing a boss enemy for it, or solving a puzzle to get it down. This doesn't seem like a lot until you realize that transporting Pikmin to a spot without them getting killed, having enough of that right type, and making sure they'll make it back in time while you multitask and do other stuff takes constant improvisation and on-the-fly decision making, plus the reflexes because this technically still is an action game. It's also here where the tone decidedly shifts. The music is slow and unassuming, but in a more neutral way. These mellow guitar chords that pitch bend in a quirky way feel more like background than a memorable melody, while these single backing notes drone on in a very atmospheric way as if there's something sinister lurking right beyond your vision or beneath the surface. The music is, in general, more quiet, reserved, and way less reassuring than before. All this and you're still racing the same time limit for each day. You have to stay on pace and keep retrieving parts, but finding them, learning the layout of the map, and managing your Pikmin also takes time. This gets overwhelming really fast. You always feel like you're working at a faster pace than you're comfortable. Another thing that comes into play here are the different Pikmin types and the elemental hazards. Fire Pikmin are immune to fire, water Pikmin are, well, I already said it, and yellow Pikmin can carry explosives and reach higher spots. And some ship pieces are best handled with more than one type. Finding enough ship parts allows Olimar to travel further, this time to the third and final main area of the game, the Distant Spring. Here, as time ticks closer to Olimar's demise, the game drops all pretense of cuteness and quirkiness. This area is very sprawling, covered in water, enemies are plentiful, and the scenery has a more muted tone to its colors, with pale sand, overgrown and untamed weeds, moss and grass, and cold-looking teal water. The water gets deep in places, meeting concrete-like walls and structures, and intertwined with gently sloped sand that pushes through the surface. And the music is bleak, cold, atmospheric, alien ambience. You can interpret it as breathtakingly beautiful or haunting and foreboding depending on how well you're doing. But it's completely minimalist and atmospheric, a far cry from the goofy, innocent little tune you heard when you wandered around the crash site. You have a lot of work to do here and limited time to do it. This area has the most ship pieces out of them all, and while walking through the water with blue Pikmin is fine, don't expect just that one type to be the answer to all your problems. Getting red and yellow Pikmin around isn't easy here. You'll have to spend your time wisely figuring out which pieces to go for on each day, which puzzles to solve, and the best way to get those pieces back. The enemies are larger, they're tougher, and along the way you're going to need to figure out how to take out another boss enemy. 
and a few ship pieces are sitting on top of large structures. The feeling of barely being able to reach a few of them lends so well into the overall survival theme of the game. This is my favorite area in the game because, even in comparison to the others, this is the loneliest and most isolated the game made me feel. I can't tell if this area is beautiful or deadly, lonely or comforting. Rarely have I had an area in a video game give me so many conflicting feelings at once. That's compounded even more by what happened the first time I cleared the area and was ready to leave. I had no major tasks left to do, and the sun was setting, and I kept my Pikmin in a safe place without taking any unnecessary risks. It was just me walking around, saying goodbye, and getting nostalgic over this isolated space that ironically, I had just spent many in-game days desperately trying to retrieve ship parts from, so I could get out of there. As the sun sets in this area, a super melancholy theme starts drifting in over the chilling ambience. It's peaceful, but in a sad way. Like, Olimar is heading back to the immediate safety of his ship, but he's not guaranteed to ever live to tell the tale back in Civilization. At this point, if you haven't, you'll need to backtrack to the other areas to get the remaining ship parts. It kind of threw me off the first time because one of the pieces was inside of a boss enemy identical to the one I fought in this spring. I was still hurrying, but I wasn't really scared of any unknown threat until I made my way up here and was ambushed by the actual boss of the area, this trio of bird serpents. Learning how to take these out on the fly was tough, but I persevered. One other stop you have to make is the original crash site where you found the first piece. It is rich with resources, but you need to assess how much time you actually want to spend farming resources when you are still running out of time. Finally, with 29 of the 30 pieces, the ship can reach the last area of the game, appropriately named the final trial, and I couldn't think of a more fitting way to end the entire game. Encouraging music backs you as if to give you one last needed motivational push after all the stress the game put you through, but it still contains enough dissonance and unease to make you still worried about what might be coming next. Your first task is to solve a big puzzle with three lanes to reach the other side. In a way, this is like the final boss of the rest of the game's puzzles. Then, you break down this barrier, and yeah, this area looks ominous. Throw a Pikmin at this thing, and it reveals itself. This is the biggest, strongest alien creature in the whole game, and you need to beat him. Yellow Pikmin are super useful here because they can utilize the bombs to stun him in a way the game hasn't made you interact with enemies before. This thing is scary and monstrous, and just when you think you have the pattern down, at low health he enters this second pattern in a desperate rage to kill you. Don't lose your confidence, or else you're a goner. Defeat him, get the final object, carry it back to the ship. After Olimar bids farewell to the Pikmin, in absolutely the funniest payoff ever, they go from being chased by wild creatures the whole game, when you're not attending to them, to teaming up and taking them on themselves, in a, what looks like a decisive victory. Good to know they'll live on without Olimar there to lead them. And that's Pikmin. And what do I say? The second the game ends and you get this final score tally, it's intoxicating. You want to play it again and use your skills to do even better. It's unique, it's addicting, it's lonely, it's quirky, it's atmospheric, it's stressful, it's scary. This game rules and I need to call it a masterpiece or else I'm not doing it justice. This is now one of my favorite games on GameCube, no doubt. Which is great, but this game got a sequel. How the heck is the second game supposed to top this one that I see as nearly flawless and perfect as is? How will they keep the spirit of this game intact without downright copying it beat for beat? Only time will tell when I make it through Pikmin 2, also on the GameCube. Yeah, it sucks that I never played this game until now, but hey, maybe that's a good thing because it's always fun discovering a new game for an old system you thought you'd already seen most of. But at the same time, I feel guilty. It's the fault of ignorant people like me that they need to work so hard to get the new Pikmin 4 the attention it, hopefully, deserves. I haven't played it yet. I'll get there soon enough. Next time I'll be looking at Pikmin 2. See you then.